to start by asking you a question that's a little bit of a follow-up about something you said last night about the place of politics in contemporary African-American writers. Mm -hmm. And if I understood you correctly, um, you were suggesting that maybe explicitly political subject matters, writers of your generation feel less of an urgency to front load those topics in their poetry than the writers of, say, the 50s and 60s. Hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know whether or not we feel less of an urgency to front load political matters. What I do know is that we have a great deal of fear about any subject matter whatsoever. Um, it seems to me that writers of my generation are, and not necessarily African-American writers per se, but just the gamut of writers in the United States have a problem with writing about anything and seeing their writing as a reflection of a subject. Uh, by that, what I mean is at some point, I mean, th it seems to me that there was a time that poetry was yet another way of getting at a subject, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, while my first book is about music, it is also about domestic violence and people who are interested in those subjects hopefully will find my book and somehow be better informed about those subjects in a different way. Um, through poetry, they get information about those subjects that they would not get uh, in, in prose, um, whether it be uh, history or, or nonfiction or, um, or, or fiction, right, or journalism. Um, and so part of what I see happening in a lot of, a lot of poems is that they're not necessarily, a lot of poets don't want to necessarily be writing about anything that is on the ground, right? Um, if you ask um, poets something about their subject matter, um, I would, I actually think many of them would be confused as how to answer and those who are not confused as how to answer, I think their answer would often be somehow a bit more ethereal. Mm -hmm. um, so as opposed to writing about, as I just said, domestic violence, um, uh, other poets of my generation would instead say, well, I'm writing about desire. Mm. You know? And there's something about that, not that desire is not a subject, but there is something about that that I think sidesteps actuality and sort of sidesteps um, what poetry can do and can, can mean for people who read it. Where, uh, where do you think that comes from? Why, where do you think this anxiety and fear about actuality comes from? I mean, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I wasn't there. You know, you're always hearing, you know, you always hear the phrase, the proliferation of MFA programs, right? Yes. Which yeah. leads to this idea um, about craft sort of coming uh, before the spirit of the poem. Uh, and and in, a, in a large way, I, I even agree, right, that you can write about anything. Anything can be made. Any set of words can be turned into a beautiful poem if you have the skills necessary to turn those words into a beautiful poem. And yet I also feel that every poem, every poet should have his or her, um, his or her, what Lucy Brock Broido once referred to as Dane, right? Yeah. His or her subject, his or her driving force, his or her obsessions. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having those obsessions and knowing what those obsessions are and speaking to those obsessions from a perspective as if they are important and as if they can make a difference mm. in the world. Um, and I think that is part of what makes for better poetry. Now, that is not to say that 
I think the poet has to be a political being. It's just that I think the poet is. To get back to this idea of politics, I think a lot of the fear around writing about political subject matters is this idea that you want your poetry to be timeless and universal. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you're saying is that that's not as much of a concern for you, that you think about particular audiences, mm -hmm. um, and so that maybe you're writing for a particular reader. Well, but those the, the particular art audiences that I think of are timeless and universal. Um, I mean, we could have a conversation, if you like, Elizabeth, about universality, because I'm not sure how much I believe in that or, or that I know what people are talking about when they talk about that. Um, like, I don't think, for instance, Hopkins is universal. I definitely don't think um, Stevens is universal. Mm -hmm. And yet I love those poets, but I don't, I don't love them because they're universal. You know, um, I love them because I love them. Yeah. Right, like I love him. I love Hopkins because he sounds crazy. He does sound crazy. That's why I like <laughs> Hopkins. That's. I mean, I don't. I don't even take the time to try and figure it out. I might take the time and try to figure it out with with Stevens. With Hopkins, I'm not like trying to figure out what he's talking about. You know, yeah. I just like enjoy the poems, and I'm okay with that. You do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Um, uh, but that's not what you asked me. You asked me something else. And oh, so you know, like. The fact of me standing in a room and reading to an audience of women and choosing poems uh, that I think would appeal to that audience of women is quite universal. Mm -hmm. Like that's not going to change. An audience of women is an audience of women. Um, and I, and women are going to have periods, you know. And if a woman doesn't have a period, she's going to miss it. Do you know that she's yes. going to think about I had or I, I'm the woman here who doesn't. Do you know what I mean? Like they have menstruation in common, at least. Do, do, do you follow what I'm saying? Yes, and so yeah. because, because of that, um, you know, whether I do that now or 30 years from now, that's not, that's not really going to change. Yeah. Um, I think in some ways when the word universal is thrown around, there seems to be particular writers who have access to the moniker universal. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about universal themes in Shakespeare, mm -hmm. even though he's writing about this particular mm -hmm. elderly white British man mm -hmm. named King Lear. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, the particularities are brushed aside mm -hmm. in the way that it's, that's not done in the critical conversation mm -hmm. with writers of color. Exactly. Right. And I, I actually think that what, no, what, what, White people are going to have to understand that when black people and people of color read about white people, what they are doing is opening them in themselves an opportunity for acceptance, an opportunity for seeing something that they have not necessarily lived. It is not that they too have lived it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. Like white people are like, you, you know this about white people. White people are crazy, especially <laughs> white men. I mean, it's oh, embarrassing. Yeah. Like, they're crazy. Like, they really believe, well, the reason why this is the thing that is everlasting is because it is the thing that everybody can see. It's not the thing everybody can see. Mm -hmm. It's just that we are in a position, women, people of color, are in a position where we have to open our eyes in order to see it. And I know that if I'm capable of opening my eyes in order to see what you have written, then you are capable of opening your eyes to see what I have written, you know? Yeah.